Greetings, fellow mathematicians. We're going to take a look at the problem of simple harmonic motion from the point of view of differential equations. Our goal for this video will be two parts. We're going to convert this into first a differential equation, and then we'll solve it. And we'll find that our solution for the position x as a function of time comes out to this, a combination of sine and cosine. Now our second goal is going to be to reconcile these two different looking solutions, which come from two different courses. This is our solution from the point of view of differential equations, but in your physics course, you might have encountered this form for the solution. So we're gonna show how you can convert between them using Euler's formula. So let's get to our first goal, coming up with a differential equation for all of this. So to start, we're gonna need three quantities, all of which are functions of time. X will denote the position of the object, V will denote the velocity, and A will denote the acceleration, all of which are functions of time. Now we also need two basic relationships, which go back to your Calc 1 course. Velocity, that's the first derivative of position, and acceleration, that's the second derivative of position. All right, besides that, we're only gonna be considering the spring acting on the mass or object, and we need a formula for the spring force, but if you've taken a basic physics course, you probably encountered this, what's known as Hooke's Law. And the spring force, it's a very simple formula, negative kx, x denotes the displacement and k is just some constant, called the spring constant. The negative's there, because if I pull the object to the right, if my displacement is to the right, the spring force will act in the opposite direction to pull the object back to equilibrium position. In other words, the spring force always opposes displacement, which is why the negative's there. All right, we have everything we need, we're just gonna plug all this into Newton's second law, which you probably know as F equals MA. All right, so we have just a single force, only the spring force. And in order to get an appropriate differential equation, you can say that velocity is the first derivative of position. Similarly, acceleration is the first derivative of velocity, but we want to get a differential equation involving position. So we're going to think of the acceleration term as the second derivative of position. We're going to replace A with X double prime. All right, we have a second order differential equation here for the position of the object. Let me go ahead and add that kx term to the other side. So we'll get as our differential equation mx double prime plus kx equals zero. We generally wanna have a one in front of your second derivative term. So let me divide both sides by the mass m And we're gonna introduce maybe a familiar quantity. We're gonna introduce what's called the angular frequency, omega squared, which is k over m. The equivalent version is omega it is the square root of k over m. So I can plug that in here and rewrite that as x double prime plus omega squared times x equals zero. And we'll get a very simple characteristic equation. Now we have to be careful here. Earlier, when we encountered second order differential equations, we had y as a function of x. 
So let's write down a similar looking differential equation with y in it. That might have looked like y double prime plus omega squared y equals zero. And you hopefully recall how we convert to the characteristic equation. We try solutions of the form y equals e to the rx. And due to how derivatives work, this would convert to the characteristic equation r squared. The r squared comes from the second derivative of this function. So we get r squared plus omega squared equals zero, and we can solve for the characteristic roots there. The only difference now is we're going to convert this to x as a function of time. So instead of y equals e to the rx, we just assume here x equals e to the rt, very simple exponential functions of time. And if you plug that in, very similar to the work for the characteristic equation, this will convert to r squared plus omega squared equals zero. All the usual tricks still apply. You can factor the exponential out from all the terms there. And we get our characteristic equation, which we can easily solve. Subtract omega squared. And the key step here, take a square root. But since we have a negative, this is going to lead us to imaginary values. So we get our characteristic roots as plus or minus i omega. We're going to write that in the form of a complex number, 0 plus or minus i omega. And we can identify our real part, which is 0. And our imaginary part, b, which is basically the number multiplying i. In this case, that's that quantity omega that we introduced. And now we just plug those into our standard solution in the case of complex characteristic roots. Let's go ahead and write down what that would have looked like earlier. So this might look familiar. y equals c1 e to the ax sine of bx, and then plus c2 e to the ax cosine of bx. Now we're just going to convert, replace here instead of y, we have x. And instead of x as our independent variable, we have t. So our solution here converts c1 e to the at sine of bt plus c2 e to the at cosine of bt. And we have our values for the real and imaginary parts, a and b. And if we plug those in, notice we again get e to the 0, which is 1. And we're just replacing b inside the trig functions with omega. So we get as our solution for position, x equals c1 sine of omega t plus c2 times cosine of omega t. And that achieves our first goal coming up with a differential equation, and then getting the solution. What we're going to take a look at next is how we convert our mathematical solution to the solution you might have encountered in a physics course. There's a number of ways that you can do the conversions between these two solutions. Most of the standard ways involve trigonometric identities, and we don't want to do that. The way that I like to do the conversion in my differential equations course is with Euler's formula. It's a lot simpler, it's much cleaner, 
and it shows you the magic of complex numbers in Euler's formula. Now, to use Euler's formula to do this conversion, we need some related identities. First, we need Euler's formula, and then we're going to replace everywhere theta with negative theta, and then you use your even and odd properties. You might recall a negative inside of sine, which is an odd function. You can bring the negative out front, and you get this identity. Now, with these two identities, you can add them together, the sine terms will cancel, and you'll be able to solve for cosine in terms of complex exponentials. If you were to subtract these equations in a similar fashion, you can solve for sine. So we're going to make use of these to easily do the conversion instead of dealing with a lot of complicated trigonometric identities. All right, so the way that we're going to convert is we're going to start with the solution that you might have encountered in a physics course, and then we'll convert to the solution that we found by solving our differential equation. So first step, I'm going to replace my sine term here with this identity here, sine in terms of complex exponentials. We're going to replace theta everywhere there with omega t plus phi. So we'll first write this as a. The sine identity, we get a 1 over 2i times e to the i theta, but theta will be replaced with omega t plus phi. And we get minus e to the negative i, and again, omega t plus phi. All right, from here, the reason why you want to make use of Euler's formula is exponential functions are much easier to work with than trig functions. So first, I'll distribute the i through the parentheses in each of those complex exponentials. And since we're adding in the exponent, I can rewrite addition in the exponent as multiplication of bases. So let me keep the constants, a times 1 over 2i out front. We'll split that apart and get e to the i omega t times e to the i phi. And we'll do pretty much the same thing with this complex exponential. Distribute your negative i. So we get e to the negative i omega t times e to the negative i phi. Now what I'm going to do is distribute this constant in front through the parentheses to each term. Keep in mind, a, omega, and phi are all constants. It's only t that appears in here that we're thinking of as our variable. So let me go ahead and distribute these constants in front through the parentheses. And I'm going to write this in a particular way. We have a over 2i times e to the i phi times e to the i omega t. I'm going to distribute these constants in front to this term. There's a minus. And again, I'll write that as a over 2i. Here we have times e to the negative i phi, but times e to the negative i omega t. And the key step here, this looks very complex. We're going to simplify it. A phi, e, 2, and i, those are all constants. So let's call that a constant c1. And same thing there. All right, this puts us mostly through the conversion. So let's rewrite this as c1 times e to the i omega t, 
we'll have minus C2. But now E to the minus I omega T. And to get our solutions, which contain sine and cosine of omega T, let's go ahead and convert from complex exponentials back to sine and cosine using Euler's formula. So we'll apply Euler's formula to each part. So be careful and use parentheses. So C1. I'm going to replace E to the I omega T here. So theta, we're going to replace it with omega T again. So we get cosine of omega T. And the version with the positive up there gives us plus I. sine of omega t. And we're going to do pretty much the same thing, just using this other version for this term. So we have minus c2. And that other version says we have cosine of now omega t. But now minus i sine of omega t. We're basically done. Hopefully you can see you have two types of terms, cosines and sines. If we collect all of our cosine terms, looks like we have c1 as a coefficient here. And what do we have here? Minus c2. And we have sine coefficients here might be easier if you were to distribute, but we're just trying to get through this quickly without too much extra work. So if you distribute here, looks like you get I C1. And then be careful with your positive and negative signs. We have a negative times a negative. That's plus I C2. And those are your coefficients of sine. The last step here is to recognize C1 minus C2 is a constant. Let's call that, let's say D1. And I C1 plus I C2 is another constant. So let's call that D2. And if we write it down, we have finally converted to what we're looking for. We get a solution here that's a combination d1 times cosine of omega t. Plus d2 times sine of omega t. And that is what we wanted to show. We wanted to convert from this solution to that one. Now it looks slightly different. First off, switch the order of addition. That takes care of that part. But notice we have constants D1 and D2. The labeling for those constants is arbitrary. This is exactly the same thing as that. So hopefully you enjoyed seeing just how quickly you can do that conversion using Euler's formula and complex exponentials, using normal trigonometric identities takes you a lot longer. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you enjoyed seeing how to use Euler's formula. If you're learning a lot, support the channel, like and subscribe.